All right, everybody, we're going to kick off this final session. Once again, the final session of the day is going to be on the state of organics recycling. In this session, we'll start by looking at the current state of organics composting infrastructure and residential access to composting pro programs nationwide. Nora Goldstein, editor of BioCycle, is joining us today remotely to give us a lay of the land in that respect. <clears throat> BioCycle recently completed a nationwide survey of food waste composting infrastructure and residential food waste collection access, and Nora will share some of BioCycle's findings from that research. We're also jo joined by Ben Knudsen, Waste Reduction and Recycling Supervisor for Hennepin County, Minnesota, and we are here in Hennepin County right now. Ben will talk about Hennepin County's path from the position where the county aimed to incentivize and support organics collection programs to eventually requiring both residential and commercial organics collection programs. Then I'm going to say a few words about our organics collection program here in Minneapolis and the key elements of our program that we believe contributed to its success, elements that we think other cities could possibly put in place. And to round out the panel, Bob Craig's National Solid Waste and Resource Recovery Technical Services Leader with Burns and McDonald will discuss the emerging trend of using anaerobic digestion technologies to enhance organic materials processing capacity. And then after that, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Let's get started, and I believe we're leading off with Nora, and she will, she will be remote. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, everybody. Is the audio okay? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm sorry I'm not there with you, especially since you just had some uh, dessert and coffee, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, BioCycle has been conducting surveys for pretty much since I started working here over 40 years ago, and uh, we began tracking food waste composting infrastructure and residential food waste collection access in the mid 90s. Um, sorry, let me figure out how to advance. There we are. Okay, apologies there. Uh, so BioCycle defines full scale food waste composting uh, as uh, facilities that take roughly more than 2,500 tons a year of feedstocks and are open year round and can accept truckloads of organic waste. That's compared to community composting sites that typically, you know, can't handle truckloads or other sites like yard trimming sites that don't operate year round. Uh, so we did the um, surveyed all what we identified as full scale facilities and I and found 201 in the United States. I know we're missing some, but it's a uh, it's the best, you know, what we could find. And you'll see the concentration of facilities is on the West Coast and then a fair number in the Northeast to Mid-Atlantic states. Uh, the Southeast is sort of sparse. Um, and even the Midwest, where you all are, isn't heavily populated with, with food waste composting sites. So just a quick snapshot of of what we data we collected on these facilities, uh, but still, and this has been the predominant case uh, in terms of methods of composting, turn windrows either with loaders or mechanical turners is uh, the most popular, but catching up quickly are aerated static pile method or a combination of aerated static pile and windrow. Uh, and one of the reasons for that uh, is food waste uh, can be messy and sloppy and um, odorous. And so putting it in aerated static piles and covering it when you first build the pile really helps to control odors and process control. Um, and usually those piles are covered with a layer of uh, finished compost. So more and more, and the footprint, you can get more material on that site. So that's one of the reasons we're seeing a shift to ASP on in terms of food waste composting. Generator, generator type serviced as you would expect, let these facilities almost all take in some kind of municipal yard trimmings, leaves, grass, brush, 
uh, chip wood from tree trimmers, wood waste. Um, the next uh, most common generator serviced are commercial sector, restaurants and supermarkets, followed by institutional. And you look down and really of those we surveyed, um, and this is 173 facilities responding, roughly a little more than, than half do service uh, residential food uh, scrap collection programs. And then as far as markets go, uh, the biggest market continues to be commercial landscapers, nursery golf courses, followed by residential turf, gardens, landscape, definitely more and more inroads in states in conventional ag, and also seeing more and more in terms of um, erosion control and stormwater management engineered soils like SET does in the, the Minneapolis area. Um, so what's interesting and probably the most significant takeaway, and this hasn't changed since BioCycle last surveyed uh, full-scale food waste facilities in 2018, is that the vast majority of facilities take less than 5,000 tons a year of source separated food waste, uh, but even more so, the biggest category takes less than 2,500 tons a year of source separated food waste. So we always ask the numbers in a range. Compost manufacturers seem to be more comfortable providing the data in a range. And so you can see if taking even the maximum number of that range, uh, 2.6 million tons of food waste composted in the US, give or take, uh, that's only processing up to 4% of the 6 million tons of total food waste generated annually in the United States. So really, in terms of composting infrastructure, taking food waste, it's, it's, it's still a, a, a very small number. We also surveyed um, municipally supported residential food waste collection access in the US and by municipally supported all the programs we surveyed uh, were essentially either run by the municipality or contracted out by the municipality to do the, the collection. And um, we last did this survey in 20, just two years ago in 2021. And I think it's interesting you see that the largest number of programs are on the West Coast, which is not surprising um, at all. Um, and that's where 50 of the food waste composting facilities are. Conversely, Minnesota and Illinois come in, uh, have 92 programs between them. And there's 12 facilities in in those states combined uh, in the other Midwest states. So really not a lot of infrastructure given the number of programs. And then New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts account for 99 programs. And in our food waste infrastructure a survey that showed 20 facilities. So um, California run leads the pack. Uh, we uh, ran out of time to survey all the new programs in California. The state has, as I'm sure many of you know, what's called SB 1383. It's a mandate to get all organics out of the landfill uh, by 2025. And it became, uh, jurisdictions had to start complying uh, beginning of 2022. So uh, we got to any city with population over 40,000. And so we still have a little bit of data collecting left to do. Just to show by comparison, when we look at these municipally supported programs, um, there's, we call programs are who runs the program, the jurisdiction, be it a county or a solid waste authority. And then within those programs, they represent 710 communities. Uh, still found programs in 25 states, a significant jump in, in numbers of households served, primarily reflected by uh, the addition of California from about 10 million two years ago to close to 15 million uh, this year. And um, it by percent of US households, it's still fairly small. Um, and then I just have this slide here that shows when we first started serving, this says 2005, but we actually started before then, but there was about a half million people in the country. 
And so what are we, 15, 18 years later, we're up to uh, close to 15 million. Uh, we survey, we divide our findings into curbside only programs, drop off only, and curbside plus drop off. And you can see that by program number, the majority are curbside only followed by drop off and then uh, curbside plus drop off. And that's because we don't want to double count. But in terms of community service, there's a more community service by drop off than curbside. So just different ways to slice and dice the data. Um, I just referenced the, the little figure on the, the right, but in terms of how food waste is set out for collection, uh, co-collection with yard trimmings, that's using the yard waste cart to, to add the food scraps to, it still makes up the majority of, of uh, types of collection programs like Minneapolis, St. Louis Park in, in your area where you are uh, right now collects the food scraps and uh, in this case, soiled paper and other, other compostable, certified compostable products in their own container. And we're starting to see, and this is mostly being piloted in the state of Connecticut. It has been going on, I think, in a couple of the twin city area cities where the food waste, uh, source separated food waste is collected in a designated bag and put into uh, the trash container and then it gets sorted out. Um, in terms of types of feedstocks collected uh, by both curbside and drop off, they very much mirror each other. Um, fruit and vegetable scraps followed pretty closely by uh, meat, fish and dairy. Soiled paper and pizza boxes uh, are, are very commonly collected. A mistake on me, the uh, biocycle, the surveyor, is next time around, we're going to separate soiled paper from pizza boxes because we lump them together and it's just, it, you get, don't get a good enough sense of what is just soiled paper only. Uh, interestingly, certified compostable liner bags are, accept, are allowed in um, number of programs, um, and you'll see us, you know, the numbers drop as far as certified compostable food service, where uh, more drop off programs accept them than, than uh, curbside uh, and molded fiber containers are not widely accepted, but again, that might have gotten a little mixed up with in the pizza, soil paper pizza boxes. Um, one of the things that we look at in the survey, um, and oftentimes like this year's survey was uh, the sponsored by Closed Loop Partners uh, Composting Consortium. A couple of years ago, it was BPI and the Food Service Packaging Institute, and they don't influence our survey. They're just willing to support BioCycle to conduct it. But we're seeing that you know, the programs do collect you know, more programs allow certified compostable food contact packaging that can be bioplastic or molded fiber. And more composters are accepting the certified compostable food contact pack, uh, yeah, food contact packaging. So that's that number has evolved to the higher side uh, since we've been doing uh, the surveys. And just as far as takeaways, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, given all the focus on, on food waste composting, it seems in a lot of places in this country, and admittedly, I it's what I do for a living, tracking this stuff, so maybe I think it should be more, uh, but when we, there's only an 8% increase in the number of facilities we identified between um, 2018 and 2023, so five years, it's not like that number has jumped up significantly. As I noted during the presentation, 60% of the facilities take less than 5,000 tons a year of food waste. We're starting to see gradually with pre-consumer food waste, a little bit of competition in some regions uh, for the, the pre-consumer commercial institutional with anaerobic digesters who uh, are set up with their depackagers and whatnot to take that, that uh, pre-consumer stream uh, 
notably just in the last two years, the number of households in the US with access increased by almost 50%. Uh, low particip participation rates and contamination continue to pose significant challenges to program managers. Uh, tracking and measuring participation is definitely a challenge. We didn't have that many uh, jurisdictions uh, respond to, you know, that actually measure participation rates. Um, and this was one significant takeaway, and it's evident in California where the program jurisdictions have to come into compliance or they'll get fined. And similarly, Hennepin County, which you'll hear about shortly, uh, has an ordinance that the jurisdictions have to offer the program in California, their the residents in theory are mandated to participate under a municipal ordinance. But if the jurisdictions are simply offering the program to check a box that we've complied and not really paying attention to efficacy, they have less investment in the program versus we're seeing municipalities that either are offering residential food waste collection as part of a climate action plan or a, a significant commitment to get organics out of the landfill. Uh, there's more of a commitment to really try to boost participation. Um, so that's all I have. I'm just going to stop screen sharing here and look forward to the other presentations. Thank, thank you, Nora. Now we've got Ben Knutson from Hennepin County. Hopefully they're not your slides, Bob. But. There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. And for those of you who don't live here or I haven't talked to you yet, I just want to give a little background about Hennepin County. We have Minneapolis, 44 cities total, 1.2 million people. We got the Vi Vikings, Twins, Wolves, Lynx, Lake Minnetonka, Mall of America, and sometimes it snows in April. Wait, wait, wait too much in April. I know I mentioned some of, some of this yesterday, but we got 89.7 inches this last winter. And I want to let Dave and Kelly know that I very vigilantly shoveled out my carts, so <laughs> even though it was up to there. A little Minnesota context as well, because this is important. We have a waste management hierarchy uh, with reuse at the top, or prevention and reuse at the top, and then recycle compost, waste to energy, and then finally landfilling. We have a 75% recycling goal by 2030. Now, we're only at 41% in Hennepin County right now. We have a solid waste management tax. That's a state tax. And then yard waste is banned from the trash. And the most important piece here, all Minnesota recyclers are above average. Fact. Uh, we, I, I think I mentioned to you, some of you yesterday, we have a waste energy facility that can process up to 365,000 tons a year. But we're not talking about waste energy today. We're talking about everything we do for zero waste. And I'm going to focus on organics. So we have a transfer station uh, that accepts, well, we get about 10,000 tons a year through this facility. And then from there, we send it on to one or two compost sites in the South Metro. And when we started, you know, things were at zero. So we started with incentives. And so we had a tipping fee of, well, I won't go back in the day, but we still have a tipping fee incentive for organics, $35 a ton versus $69 for trash. We, we also accept trash at our transfer station. So that's a big incentive to separate, get it out of the trash. And there's also taxes and fees on trash. The county has a fee. And when we add that to the state tax, you see it's 38.5 for non-residential, 25.25 for residential. So that's, that's a powerful incentive. And that's re really what got things rolling, especially in the commercial sector. So we saw a lot, lot more action there on organics recycling early on. And we kind of shifted to, all right, we need to do more with cities. Uh, we need to partner with them to get it rolling. And our first pilot was in 2003 with Wyzetta. And 
And it wasn't until I think around 2007, 2008, when more city pilots started getting up and running. So we had fun with Hot Dish in Minnesota. I don't know for, from where you're all from. I, I grew up in Nebraska, and it was, it was casserole, so I had to adapt to Hot Dish. But we, we kind of used that in some of our promotional materials. So on the left there, that was a brochure. On the right there, uh, that was a cart hanger. So we, we were promoting these pilots, trying to get more people uh, to participate. Just put a foot in the water. So we, I, I did this just for fun. This is probably too much, but uh, I was like, oh, how did this really happen? And it's just like bit by bit, bit by bit, every year, doing a little more. And so in 2008, uh, that was when Minneapolis first started their organics pilot. Then the county did a big initiative. We're like, oh, we got to do better. We got to get more out of the trash. So we did transforming solid waste management. It's a big process, a lot of engagement, almost too much engagement. Uh, but, but we learned a lot there, and then we said, all right, we're going to make some changes. We're going to have a re resolution that uh, cities need to do single sort or dual sort. And that was a big change for Minneapolis, you know, going from multi-sort, and they, they chose to move forward with sing single sort. And we set kind of a tight, that's kind of the theme here. Uh, Minneapolis did a great job rolling out both single sort and organics because we set some almost impossible timelines there. Uh, so resolution in 20, 2011, 2012, Minneapolis rolled out single sort. Uh, then following on the heels there, 2013, we had a business recycling incentive program where we said, all right, we have $300,000 available in grants for businesses to do do organics recycling, then, or, or t traditional recycling. Then we upped that budget to 500,000 a year, and that really gave businesses a lot of support. Then, and this maybe this this is both good and bad. In 2014, we had an, our board passed a resolution saying, "Hey, cities of the first class must implement organics recycling by 20 January 1, 2015." By state statute in Minnesota, there's only one city in Hennepin County of the first class. So we were kind of naming names uh, without, without going there. So that was pointing at Minneapolis. And yeah, it was, it was pretty unfair, because I think that, that uh, 2014 resolution was, I think, in February 2014, saying like, all right, you have uh, good luck. You have less than 11 months to roll out like, a gigantic program. But you know, I think part of the reason we keep doing this is because Minneapolis uh, keep stepping up and, and, and implementing these programs. So in 2015, that was phase one of their curbside organics rollout. And then in 2016, we revised our residential recycling funding policy. So we have about $3.6 million a year that we get from the state. Some of that comes from, well, that comes from the solid waste management tax. Uh, we want more of that tax for these purposes, but we pass through 100% of those funds to cities for their curbside programs. And in the past, it was all for traditional recycling. But we said, all right, traditional recycling, it's time to, time to move out. You know, it's time to move out, move out of the basement, get a job, support yourself. Organics is the future here. So it's a young, younger child. Uh, so 2017 to 2020, you see how we allocated those funds as a percent. And I think it was beneficial to Minneapolis. They got a lot of funds because we kind of allocated on a participation basis. So how many, how many households do you have on your program uh, for, for recycling, but also for organics? How many people are signed up for organics? So that's, we, we got a formula for how we allocate the funds there. I also want to highlight the role of plans. I know sometimes plans don't provide the impetus, but in this case, I really think they do. So the state has a metropolitan uh, policy plan for metro counties, seven county uh, metro area here, and so they give you all these strategies uh, that you have to do. And you can pick from a menu, so some are optional, but really it, it gives us a nudge in that direction. And we have to uh, draft our solid waste management plan to implement the state's policy plan. And so in our plan, we really focused on organics, number one, because we keep looking in the trash, and what's there? It's organics. So it's not you can't get around it. It's there again and again and again in, in the waste sorts. So we said, all right, the county's going to do more on requirements. We're going to do more on infrastructure, and we're going to do more on food waste prevention. So I like to think we have incrementalism, but maybe a little punctuated 
uh, incrementalism. So it's some, some exciting points along the way. So we, our board adopted that plan, and then in 2018, we uh, made our recycling ordinance revisions. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail in a little bit. Uh, but on the heels of that, we're like, all right, if we're getting more of this out of the trash, we gotta make sure we can process it. So we also had a board briefing on anaerobic digestion and what role we could play there. And then, well, in 20, January 1, 2020, our business food waste recycling requirement went into place. And then, you know, as, as, as was said earlier, yeah, COVID, we are, all know what happened then, so I'll skip over that. Uh, 2021, we adopted our climate action plan. We released our RFP for anaerobic digestion. January 1, 2022, city organics requirements went into place. And then just this year, uh, we completed our zero waste plan. I do want to back up to the requirements, talk a little bit about that. So I'll do, I'll do the business food, food waste recycling requirements first, since they went into place uh, sooner than the residential requirements. So, so we said, well, we want to focus on large quantity generators, which means, OK, you're in a certain sector, and you're generating a certain amount of trash. So, you know, if you're in the hospitality business, your restaurant, uh, hotel, serving wonderful cheesecake and lemon, lemon cake, you, you have to divert it back a house. Uh, if you generate one ton of trash per week or more, or eight, eight cubic yards or more. And so we, yeah, we crucially didn't, yeah, we didn't say everywhere. We said back a house. We want to focus on the clean material and, and keep it simple. So you have to have service, you have to separate, label the bins, have adequate bins, do training, all that sort of thing. Then with residential, we said, okay, we want you to make curbside service available. Uh, you don't, it's not mandatory, people don't have to participate, but we want it to be uniformly available. And we said cities, you can do it in one of two ways. You can contract citywide for service, or you can make it a hauler requirement, you can pass the buck. And then we gave a little flexibility, because Hennepin County is a big place, there are 44 cities, and you know people in Minneapolis are saying, hey, you gotta do more. Whereas if I go to a city council meeting in Western Hennepin, it has happened, I've been told to go pound sand. So there's, a, there's, there's diversity in the county, and so we get some flexibility by saying if you're a small city, 10,000 or less, you don't have to make curbside service available, you can provide a drop-off site instead. So, organics programs keep growing. I think we have, well, I, I don't know what time in 2023 this represents, maybe kind of second quarter around there, but we have 95,000 households signed up for curbside service. Minneapolis is over 56,000 of those households, and we have 45 uh, drop-off sites for organics as well. So we're getting, getting more and more organics out of the trash. A little more difficult time tracking the commercial piece of it. I mean, we see it coming into our transfer station, but we, we have one inspector to enforce that ordinance. So if, with over 3,000 potential generators, uh, if, we, if we visit 150 a year, I mean, that's gonna take us a long time to get to all of them. So, so it's a process there. But we have more and more organics coming out of the system. So we need, we need something to do with it. But we're motivated by our climate action plan, for sure. It's a foundational strategy, so it's provided a lot more attention on it. Uh, but I do want to just skip forward and kind of pass, pass the mic to, uh, to Dave from Minneapolis, because I think one thing I want to mention there is, you know, we, we've had a great partnership with cities. We have a zero waste plan now. Minneapolis will be a big part of making it happen, and uh, we look forward to continuing that partnership as well. Thanks, Ben. Ben kind of took a little bit of my thunder away. I, I wanted to talk about partnerships, and uh, Kate Davenport from Eureka was up here earlier, so that's our recycling end, end of things. But our programs work because we have good partners, and Hennepin County is a very strong one, Eureka, um, our organics processing um, individual also. So a little bit on our program history, and, I, and I, I should tell you that Ben talked a little bit about um, you know, how we were pushed into this pro program by the county, a little nudge. Um, 
But preparation, I mean, we, we kind of knew it was coming. We, we did some pilots early in 2008, um, very successful. And then knowing that it was on the horizon, we had a consultant study done. And I think that was very important because it identified some of the, I mean, we, we didn't know anything about what to anticipate with starting organics. Um, and I come from a background when I f first started out in private solid waste where um, we had law changes in, in Michigan where yard waste wasn't allowed to be landfilled any longer, so you had to have a way of processing it. So um, we were tight, tight, didn't know what to do, so we did a lot of static pile. It was inexpensive, it worked. I wanted to really push our organics program here in Minneapolis in a different direction than curbside. So we have a, a very well-known and renowned park system in, in Minneapolis. The idea it was set up with having a park within six blocks of every resident within within the city. And so I wanted to have drop-offs there. So we did start out some drop-offs and experimented with it, and I wanted to expand that, and then had some dialogue with some council members and ex-mayor who pretty much said, uh, I'll be damned if I'm gonna load organics in my car and drive it to a drop-off, but you gotta make it more convenient. So. That's what kind of pushed us towards going with, with curbside. So if you can see from this, uh, just some statistics here. We've, we have an opt-in program here. So um, you know, not everybody is prepared to, to dive into organics recycling. Um, our traditional recycling program, much easier. Um, you've got to do, be committed and do a little more work in, in processing and, or uh, preparing food waste for uh, recycling. So. Um, what we did we've, with this opt-in program, we primarily have 32-gallon green carts, as you see in the picture here, and individuals have to go online and sign up or call in. So uh, we've steadily grown, and you can see from 2015 at 30 plus percent to now we're over 53 percent, and that's 56,000 households here. So been very successful, uh, kind of a steady increase in annual tons, a little jump pandemic when more people were home, um, and we're kind of stabilizing right now. So this is some of the information that came from our consultative study on what to anticipate, how many trucks, uh, city staff, cost. It's very expensive, and not every municipality is positioned to do what we, we, do, we did. Um, our city one-time cost, primarily carts, trucks, and that was $5.5 million. We were fortunate enough to have a budget with reserves that was able to han handle that purchase. And then annually, $4.4 million it cost, you know, three, $3 plus per, per stop. Um, in the city. We've got 108,000 stops in the city. Average, whether, what, and, and with the opt-in, whether they opt in and participate or not, they're going to pay. They're paying for it, so it's built built into our base fee. So once you opt in, you know you're you're able to you're able to opt out. Some some had opted in and have have found that it was a little difficult or didn't work at times, and they've opted out. But um, it it costs some costs some money. Oh, I'll go. Well, I'll go back as far as what we anticipated. City trucks. You know, I think we anticipated more routes than we have right now. We've got seven routes in the city for organics, and probably staff, staff we've got less than that, maybe 16, we're figuring we've got a couple extra laborers uh, in a float pool. So that's a good thing, and we're, we're actually looking at, um, you know, every, every year we look at our routing or whatever, so I think right now um, we may need another recycling, traditional recycling route, and could, could possibly do, do without one of the organics routes. Our current program, uh, we do not, we, you know, we would have, we'd have liked to have been able to combine yard waste and organics, traditional yard waste and organics, uh, but we don't have any processors in the area that are set up to handle it that way. So we have the separate bin, like I said, and then our seasonal yard waste program from a April through uh, Thanksgiving is um, basically your, you have your own container or compostable bag. So like I said, 52% signed up. We still have drop, uh, organics drop-off sites, and part of that with this partnership is we still feel 
a connection with multifamily within the city, even though we don't do the, the collection there. So we wanted to have drop-offs out there for those that maybe wanted lived in multifamily that wanted to participate in our program but couldn't get a cart, or with tight alleys in that residence that live in the city may not have room or want an additional cart, so they would prefer to, to go to a drop-off that's close to their, to their house. And our organics are composted of aerobic static piles by SET out in Rosemont. Uh, program promotion, so we, we, we do a lot of things here and it's kind of modeled around some of our recycling education. We do mailings, we've got the website, we do social media, we've done TikToks. If you saw Aaliyah that was here, that's her in the organics cart right there doing a TikTok, so it's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, our collection crews, once again, we collect rear load in, in uh, tight alleys, so they're able to be our educators also. Uh, multimodal, so we're trying to figure out, hey, is it, is it printed, verbal, you know, on, on TV, is that, that work? And then we also uh, are multilingual in the promotional materials we, that we put out, four, four different translations. So we've got English, Spanish, Somali, Hmong. And then ongoing, and the important thing of this with any education, uh, we're, we're fortunate that we we look to make it sustainable and have dedicated funds every year to be able to do our education. Uh, takeaways from our program, um, opt-in, definitely the way to go. So our can't, you know, it contributes to our contamination being down, uh, ongoing education and outreach, sustainable, keep putting some money there every year. Uh, feedback loops on success and challenges, you know, working with the composter, our collection crew, and re residents. Residents do a tremendous job. I think Kelly talked about uh, our contamination, contamination rate being less than 1%. And you know, it makes your product desirable. So you know, our clean organics are wanted by those that are, have expanded into the organics processing, so we have a desired material. And then markets for finished compost. We, you know, we, don't do a, we need to do a better job there. I'm bringing this material back, closing the loop, getting it back into public works projects, using it in the city for beautification. And with that, I, and I'll go back, and you know, it's, it's funny how you, you get involved in some of these programs and some of the quirky things that happen. So when we first, this, this picture in the middle there, when we first rolled out organics, this was the first route that we were on. A young lady came out in a evening dress with her organics on a platter. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with that, I will hand it over to Bob. Thank you very much. Well, a lot of pressure. I'm, I'm the last one today. <laughs> I'm batting clean up to use some baseball analogy, and the Minnesota Twins are in the playoffs. Um, and I'm with my fellow Minnesotans here, so and I'm supposed to be above average. So I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, I've been working with local governments in the solid waste and recycling industry for more than three decades. And I can remember when uh, we were talking about mixed waste processing. We were talking about different types of innovation. So kind of the theme of what I want to talk about with all of you today is innovation. I think it's in a, very much an exciting time um, for a number of reasons. Um, you'd have to have your head in the sand if you didn't see the opportunities to fund programs through federal and state funding um, with all of the focus here on renewables. Um, there's what I would consider a nexus between organics management and energy, and that's really what I want to kind of talk about in the context of that um, this afternoon. So to give you a little bit of an overview, at, at minimum, you can see from Nora's discussion and uh, Dave and Ben, here in the Twin City area, there's a lot of organics programs in place, and there's a lot of organics that are being collected. So where are all those organics going to go? and talk a little bit about what is anaerobic digestion. It's not a new technology, um, and 
There's still a lot of debate on whether it's compatible with composting. Um, so my objective today isn't to say it's better or worse. It's a means in which to expand capacity for managing composting or for managing food waste and source separated organics. And then talk about three specific initiatives here in Minnesota. Again, this is in conjunction with the growth of the collection of organics. So in 2013, we had the opportunity at Burns and McDonald to do a statewide study in terms of the quantity of organics in the waste stream. So the pie chart isn't different than probably anything you'll see anywhere else in the country. It's very similar. It's a significant amount of organics. So we're all interested in managing uh, organics and keeping them out of the landfill. Um, that's something we need to target. So there's certainly a growth, as we talked about in uh, source separated organic material collection programs. As Nora talked about, whether it's done via with yard waste or as in Minnesota, typically it's done separately, the source separated organic collection programs certainly are growing. The drivers, here in the Twin Cities, we have limited composting capacity. There's two specific permitted facilities that um, are taking source separated organic materials and processing those um, into reusable uh, byproduct. <clears throat> Up until just in about the last year, there was some real significant concerns that neither one of those facilities were going to have adequate capacity in the next couple of years. Some things have changed. Uh, the one facility, which is uh, SMSC as it's referred to, is now building a new uh, composting infrastructure uh, down in uh, Shakopee. And then uh, Waste Management recently purchased the other private composting facility in the Twin Cities, which was referred as SET. So we do think that uh, there is some additional capacity, but with all the growth, it's not going to be adequate. There's this renewable energy demand, as we talked about. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about how anaerobic digestion fits into that. Growth in environmental credits or attributes. Um, you may have heard of um, the re Renewable Fuel Standard. Uh, which is a federal program that provides tax credits and benefits to different types of fuels that could be substituted for traditional diesel fuel and other types of transportation fuels. There's other types of environmental attributes that are associated with developing uh, renewable fuels and specifically renewable natural gas. And then just recently, there was another uh, report that was published by EPA, again, gathering information like Nora and her team did. <clears throat> so this is a flow chart in terms of characterizing specifically what <clears throat> renewable natural gas, uh, how it can be generated uh, through the process. And I don't, I'm a planner, I'm not an engineer, so I always work on my engineers and say, you got to make this understandable for the average city council member. So this is almost too much, but you can see there's, and I can say that because I'm a city council member. So it, you can see there's multiple organic types of feedstock, um, and it goes into a digester, and then ultimately uh, the biogas that comes out has to be cleaned up. But it can be cleaned up to meet specifications to actually go back into um, a natural gas pipeline. And so there's CO2 removal that takes place. So the outcomes of this process include biogas, which is mostly methane, and then what you would call digestate, which is solid and liquid uh, type of material. And the markets for those um, include everything from land application to commercial fertilizer. Over here are some of the markets associated with anaerobic digestion. And these, like I said, include not only meeting specifications to put it back into the pipeline, but also um, as a transportation fuel, and in some instances to generate electricity. But simply put, it's a biological process. It's a process in which breaks down organic material in the absence of oxygen. So composting, typically you manage the process through oxygen, you manage it through water and temperature, and here it's put in an enclosed uh, particular container. So the, one of the initiatives in the state of Minnesota, which um, exemplifies multiple ways in which local governments can leverage their own assets to address organics management, is something that's been undertaken by the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District, which is 
basically Duluth proper is the way we'll put it, and Duluth sits up on Lake Superior. So there are hundreds of what we would call wastewater digesters located throughout the United States. They manage biosolids from wastewater treatment plants. Many of them um, are not uh, being used to the capacity, so therefore they're an underutilized asset. So what Western Lake Superior Sanitary District chose to do, um, and they're in the process of that, is leverage that asset and they're upgrading their uh, wastewater treatment digester. And the upgrade is twofold. It's to buy turbines that can generate electricity. And secondly, it's to upgrade their uh, materials handling system so it can take food waste. So most of the digesters don't take fats, oils, and grease, which is a type of food waste. This type of upgrade um, has been done at a number of wastewater treatment plants. And as a, a local government environmental manager, it's critical, I think, for you to have conversations with your uh, wastewater manager within your city to see if you do have a digester and if this might be a possibility. The unique as aspect of Duluth is, is that it sits, right on, it sits right on Lake Superior. And so, they actually have had a source separate organic management composting program for a number of years, similar to as Ben talked about. They have requirements for businesses uh, to separate their food waste and they have drop offs uh, for residential. So they've been composting here and the digester, as you can see, is not too far away. But um, and then they also have a transfer station. So this is a means in which to integrate the two. So again, this is one example of how local governments can look at the back end in terms of processing capacity for organics. So Hennepin County, and I'll start by saying uh, I want to thank both Hennepin County and then Ramsey Washington counties for the opportunity to share with you uh, some of their activities. I know Michael Reed is here from Ramsey Washington, and of course Ben is here from Hennepin, and I think David was here earlier. So I had a chance to um, moderate a session earlier this year where we got updates on their programs. And so this comes from the lead for Hennepin County in terms of why they got into looking at anaerobic digestion. And I apologize to John because I also misspelled uh, his name. So Ben, you'll have to make sure you share that with him. But you can see from what Ben talked about is it's a significant growth in collection and the ability to uh, process those materials includes long hauling. Uh, I guess 45 to 50 miles is the estimate to the nearest composting facility. So Hennepin County, with all of the growth, wants to better serve its cities. And so some of the reasons for doing this is AD is potentially a better fit than composting, smaller footprint. This is an example of, of, a, of an existing facility um, that's built out in California and potentially uh, easier to control odor since it is enclosed. Uh, most of these facilities have biofilters. Um, from John's perspective, he saw some benefits in terms of climate resilience, you know, as it relates to, um, and I think Nora referenced this, you know, in terms of contact water as it relates to composting and some concerns as it relates to PFAS. And then a higher and better use of the material, the way I look at it, it's a twofer. You can put food waste through a digester and generate biogas and turn it into a renewable natural gas and you can still also have uh, beneficial soil and ag products. So this is the timeline. I got a quick finger here, Bob. So this is the timeline you can see when it comes to procuring a public-private partnership as Hennepin County undertook. Um, and again, we've all referenced COVID, so I'll skip that part of it. But um, that was in the middle of all of this. The county put out an RFP. They're specifically looking for a team to come in and uh, design and build and operate a anaerobic digester within the county. And the, the key piece of that um, is that they're currently um, in negotiations with um, the developer that they've selected. Um, for this particular um, option, they chose to provide a potential site 
which it's adjacent to the Brooklyn Park transfer station, which is not too far from here, um, and then potentially some capital funding. So the county um, would work directly with uh, the developer on the site and the site development and the permitting with the understanding that the developer of the, of specifically of the facility then would operate it in the long term. So Ramsey, Washington counties, and full disclosure, the, um, with this one, um, we are currently, Burns and McDonald, working uh, closely with uh, the private partner that Ramsey, Washington has selected. So current and future organics programs, and, and Michael is here, and, and Michael, like I said, was a part of the panel earlier this year and shared kind of the update. Um, you've heard some of this currently. Um, Basically, Ramsey, Washington County's Ramsey is where St. Paul is, for those of you that are not from Minnesota, and Washington County's is actually where I live, to the east, and they have food uh, scrap drop-off sites, um, and those materials are composted. Um, and one of the things that Nora mentioned, which I think is interesting too when thinking about collection of organics, is, and Michael and I have had a number of conversations about this, is that Ramsey Washington have chosen uh, to use durable compostable bags. So Nora said she called it co-collection. So at my house in Washington County, sometime in the future, we're not sure exactly when, right, Michael? But sometime in the future, I'll get compostable bags, I'll put my food waste in it, and then I'll set it inside my refuse cart. So then the durable compostable bags will go to a facility um, in Newport, which is uh, within the jurisdiction, and it's recently been upgraded to or retrofit to pull out those compostable bags. There is a robotic component of it, as well as the fact that the facility, which is um, owned and operated by Ramsey Washington Counties, uh, has the ability to also create what's called an organic rich material. And I can talk a little bit more about that. But as you can see, there's also the commercial component here too. The counties have been very much involved in promoting collection of SSO and food rescue, food to livestock and commercial composting. So we haven't left anything um, unused there in terms of uh, working to different markets. So after a, a procurement process that uh, was run by uh, uh, basically, the Recycling and, and, and Energy Group, which is the Joint Powers Group of Ramsey Washington Counties, um, after a couple year process, they chose uh, a team of Demcon and Itachi Zosen. So, Demcon is a waste management firm here in the region, and Itachi Zosen Bioenergy is a technology provider of anaerobic digestion. So, th they have formed a team, and this public private partnership is a little bit different than the Hennepin County uh, situation. Not that it's better or worse, but it's different. So the investment that was made um, by Ramsey Washington was in the collection and the processing, as we've talked about. And so they've selected a team to specifically take all of the materials that are collected and provide a guaranteed volume over a set period of time. And Demcon Hitachi Zosen is going to build a facility um, located here. This is uh, Highway 169, which is southwest of the cities. This is their campus um, that they currently have. Um, and so they're presently in the process of permitting the facility. What's interesting is we have source separated organic materials. That's from the durable compostable bags. We also have this organic rich material, which will also come from the facility. And these are the basically the goals associated with the collection. And back to my snarky comment about the pilot. Um, basically, the, there is a pilot currently for uh, multiple communities within Ramsey and Washington counties. And ultimately, they're growing the program to meet those particular quantities. The outputs, as I mentioned before, are biogas, and the plan and the proposal to Ramsey Washington counties is to take the uh, biogas, and we have a agreement, uh, DEMCON has an agreement, 
for that renewable uh, that uh, biogas to be cleaned up and then sold as renewable natural gas, as well as to take the digestate, which is the residuals, and specifically use a process called pyrolysis and make biochar. So if you're not familiar with biochar, it kind of looks like charcoal. It's basically a soil amendment, and there's a real uh, growth in that market. So the pyrolysis process has created some interesting challenges, and it offers some interesting benefits. Uh, again, in conversations with Michael, and Michael shared this also, we talked about PFAS. So there's a number of promising technologies to manage PFAS. And if you have food waste and contact paper uh, associated with food waste packaging, there's a potential that for PFAS um, to be in those residuals. So in the proposal that uh, basically was put forth by Demcon and Hitachi Zosen is to uh, permit and add a pyrolysis piece at the back end of the project to essentially uh, make biochar and um, the destruction of the materials through the pyrolysis process has promise in terms of destroying the PFAS. So it's an, it's an exciting project. It has a lot of additional steps to go through, but the vision that uh, Ramsey Washington County's had with this particular project, I think is very exciting. Um, I know there's been a lot of hours spent by staff as well as staff consultants, and some of them are here. Um, so we're working hard to move forward with this. The timeline associated with this um, essentially is the pilot curbside I talked about. Um, we have the curbside collection with the DCBs, which are the durable compostable bags, so that'll be ramped up to all the communities. And then uh, the commercial composting uh, during the interim period. One of the other interesting aspects of this is that it takes, obviously, multiple years to permit and, and construct a facility like this. So in the interim, um, the uh, food waste that's being collected via the durable compostable bags will go to uh, one of the composting facilities located here um, in the Twin Cities during that interim period. And that is uh, run by one of the tribal communities. Um, SMSC is their composting facility. So the goal is to have the facility up and operating by 2026 um, and to begin anaerobic digestion in 2026. As mentioned, overall, to me, this is really exciting because there's multiple ways to approach this. There's not a right or wrong way, like I mentioned, in terms of procuring this. Uh, this last uh, option is something that uh, reflects the vision, again, of Ramsey Washington counties. And then Hennepin County, again, has been working very hard um, in their process to ultimately create additional capacity as it relates to organics. In summary, if we're going to get to this goal of um, the 75% recycling goal for the state, as well as understanding this nexus between organics and uh, renewable energy, my feeling is we need something like this. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Ben, Nora. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, if you want to, once again, come up to the microphone there, or we'll find you. Any questions? A uh, question for Bob. Um, have you seen any communities that currently collect food scraps with their yard trimmings in a cart kind of move to that system where they bag it and put it in the, or, uh, the yard trimmings cart as opposed to the trash cart? Actually in a, in a plastic bag? In the durable compostable bag that we're talking about. I'm not, but I, I'm not familiar with any, but there, I don't know, maybe you are, Ben, or have heard of others. Not to put you on the spot or anything. We actually had a community go the opposite direction from collecting it, co-collecting with yard waste to a separate bin for organics. I think it's just, it's driven, I think, bo mostly by the compost sites and what they desire as a, as a product. I think one, one of the issues, too, is how do you manage the, even though they're compostable bags, there's still some skepticism that through composting and through 
anaerobic digestion that ultimately that's the best route. I know there's two schools of thought. There's those that don't think you should have any bags with them at all. I mean, the city of, the, of Minneapolis has talked about the importance of your programs with carts, and then there's others see the co-collection as really the benefit. So we didn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> I'll, I'll hire you later to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Nathan with Pope Douglas Hall Waste in greater Minnesota. So to talk a little bit about programs that happening in rural Minnesota, um, I think is applicable too for a lot of people in in the U.S. Um, we cannot collect it together because of the way the um, the environmental permits and stuff are in Minnesota. They're very strict. Um, so the, anything that's food waste has to be managed under a covered container and um, and and done with the mix of you know yard waste and wood chips at our um, um, engineered compost systems um, facility that Chocopee is going to be basically building a similar facility except much larger so we right-sized it for our people and um, and so that's 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 the reason thanks Nathan hey Zach Monroe from City New Orleans uh, coming from a place where we don't have any uh, organic um, you know uh, drop off or, or pick up yet um, I guess this is a question for uh, the city and the county here. How, how did you get started on your pilot programs? Uh, you know, how much did that cost? What kind of partnerships did you need? Uh, or what, what would you um, recommend for a city that is just trying to get this process rolling? I think it's finding people who really want to do it. So in the case of Minneapolis, I think it was a, it was a particular neighborhood too. And they're like, oh, we got to do more. And so it's con making those connections with them and then seeing what kind of resources are available at all different levels. And then yeah, I don't know what kind of appetite there is for offering an incentive at a transfer station, but I think we found that if you have the incentive in place, really then uh, it just the private sector will jump in and, and promote it uh, to their customers. I think... Ben hit the nail on the head, but I think the idea is uh, start small, start inexpensive, um, kind of tap, tap those that have the interest in the community. Um, look at your infrastructure, you know, make, make sure you've got a processor so that it'll take the material the way you want to, you know, advertise it to be prepared. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, pilots are always good. I mean, I think they, you learn an awful lot from them, and if they're successful, they're easy to expand then. I'm just going to add, Eureka was actually the first commercial compost collector in the cities, and it is because of the county's $15 tip fee. That was how we were able to do that. So there were five restaurants in 2008 that came to us and said, we want to compost our food waste. There is no way we could have made the economics of that work unless the county had their transfer station. Um, and we grew that program to about 80, and now I think almost every private hauler in the marketplace is offering that. So that county infrastructure was absolutely critical to making the private market move and provide that service. Uh, so this is, Thanks, Nora, please. I just want to offer in New Orleans, there's a community composter called Schmelly's, S-C-H-M-E-L-L-Y-S. And they've been offering through a subscription service collection of, of residential food scraps. And one of the things we've seen is where these existing, uh, and they have a, I think a comp they compost on a farm that they, they manage is for a municipality to do a, a um, kind of a preferred vendor status. So let's just say that they have capacity where they're doing the composting to take in more organic materials. And if they could get density of collection in a neighborhood, that subscription price could come down. So it's not like the city has to necessarily put money into it as other than to co-promote the program uh, to households. So that's uh, there's a company up in the Boston area called Black Earth Compost, and they're the preferred vendor in a couple of municipalities, and they've been able to get enough root density that they can lower the, the subscription price significantly. Um, so it's just something that exists in New Orleans. Um, I don't 
have not touched base with those folks to know if that's even something they would entertain. Thanks, Nora. Andrew. What, I, can I be the last? Yeah, uh, last question, thanks. <laughs> Excellent, Andrew, Andrew Kays from uh, Maryland, go Terps. Um, <laughs> so uh, as it relates to siting uh, AD facilities uh, and in the great free state of Maryland, uh, there is some consternation when it comes to AD uh, amongst certain environmental groups. Uh, they see it, one, as a shill for the natural gas industry, uh, and secondly, they see it as an issue uh, greenwashing for CAFOs, so concentrated animal facility operations or far, uh, feeding operations. Um, how have, has that development worked here have you run into those issues? And if you have, how did you address uh, potential environmental concerns with those facilities? Well, I'll start, it appears. Dave gave me the mic. Uh, <laughs> well, there's been so much discussion about education and the messaging. I think that's where you start, right? I mean, what are, what's the feedstock? I mean, if, if you're not taking manures and you and your, your message is like, as if you go to the Hennepin County website, for example, and you look at their description of anaerobic digestion, and I actually went there this morning to look, there's a video that talks about what the anaerobic digestion facility would look like, what its purpose, what its goals and objectives are, how it's tied to climate initiatives. To me, that's important. Um, secondly, I think it's also then, you need to look at, as you mentioned, the permitting process and how comprehensive is the permitting process in terms of what the requirements are. In Minnesota, we have environmental assessment worksheets that have to be submitted in relationship to getting a permit to operate these. So therefore, it's broad enough in terms of the criteria that you look at that you could use that also as part of your messaging when there's some pushback. But as we all know that not in my backyard, I mean, it, that was been around for many, many years and it's still a challenge. But I, I do think that it can be overcome. The facility for DEMCON, Itachi Zosen, is going to be on their waste management campus. At the same time, they still have to submit an environmental assessment worksheet. I guess some of the feedback we've heard is just concerns about traffic and then the concern about odor. And we can, we can address both of those. I mean, we're, we're a transfer station already. So like people are already delivering. The material there and it actually will reduce traffic because we'll manage it on site other uh, otherwise we're we have both inbound and outbound and then with the order we just we just explain the process and i guess the last thing on the site for us i mean it's unique to us but it's it's a place where people go to deliver their household hazardous waste to drop off their mattress their recycling so we're like oh yeah i've been there and and we just had open conversations with the community about what our goals are including net zero emissions by 2050. So we support electrification, but we also realize there's gotta be a transition strategy and gotta manage the waste somehow, so let's, let's make the best of that. And I, I also wanna get your descriptor for per, pearl of the what? So I, that's how you all, all right. 